forthcoming in gargoyle, fulcrum, and altered scale. So, Bill. Thank you, Gloria, for uh, hosting this. Mark, thank you for hosting this. Um, thank you, everybody, for coming out. It's a pleasure to see you all here. And thank you so much for those who read uh, uh, today. It was wonderful. I, I really, really enjoyed that. Uh, I'm going to read a few poems from uh, the uh, uh, chapbook uh, from Trevena Barbara, and uh, then I'll read some from uh, The Life of uh, Christ. Um, I know that's a weird title, and I'll try to explain it. Uh, when we get to that point. Um, so um, I'm going to start with uh, some poems from Incompetent Translations and Inept Haiku. Uh, the first one is called Rattlesnake Pancakes. <laughs> I don't usually take bets, but I took this one. Fatso bet me a melamite ring. I wouldn't eat a rattlesnake pancake. Normally I am cautious, but I needed a gift for Emily Beth. And her father, being a miner, she had a thing for melamite. The thing on my plate was the color of a dry scab, and it tasted as vile as it looked. But I got one swallow down, and then 20 followed in slow succession. I felt queasy, but Fatso never guessed. When five hours later I was still alive, he handed over the ring. I ran to Emily Beth's mom's place on Arapahoe. I found her sitting on a two-person glider on the wraparound porch. Emily Beth, I got a ring for you. Oh, blister, however did you afford a ring of melamite? That just heats my heart. Maybe so, Emily Beth, but are you tepid enough to win? A gift is not a liberty blister. I'll not marry you until father life has sucked the selfish out your soul. Selfish? Selfish? I ate snake poison for you. Yeah, but you didn't die, did you? So what's the good of that? found poems and um, so I have a, a number of them and this one is uh, called the craft ebbing poems and so this is from Psychopathia Sexualis by Richard Von Kraft Ebbing, uh, which is a wonderful book, and it's a very important book for those interested in literature. It's, I mean, uh, psychology, yes, but, but uh, <laughs> definitely for literature. So uh, it's a whole series of uh, explanations of these uh, different conditions. They're all kind of organized in an encyclopedic way. And, uh, and there are a lot of case histories, and the case histories are the most interesting uh, parts. <laughs> the Kraft Ebbing poems, case number 106. When she was about 10 years old, she thought that her mother no longer loved her. So she put matches in her coffee to make herself sick, that she might thus excite her mother's affection for her. Case number 88. On account of this impotence, the patient applied to Dr. Hammond, who treated his epilepsy with bromides and advised him to hang a shoe over his bed and to look at it fixedly during coitus while imagining his wife to be a shoe. Case number eight. As a child, he was not affectionate, was cold toward his parents. As a student, he was peculiar and retiring, preoccupied with self. He was well endowed mentally and given to much reading, but eccentric after puberty. Alternating between religious enthusiasm and materialism, now studying theology, now natural sciences. At the university, he read Jean-Paul almost exclusively. His fellow students took him for a fool. Case number 89. On his marriage night, he remained cold until he brought to his aid the picture of an ugly woman's head wearing a nightcap. Intercourse was immediately successful. Case number 36. She must stand at the window awaiting him with her face done up, and on the entrance into the room, complain of severe headache. He is sorry for her, asks particularly about the pain, takes the cloth off, and then puts it on again. He never touches her, yet in this simple act, finds complete sexual satisfaction. Case number 55. On their wedding night, he forced a towel and soap into her hands, and without any other expression of love, asked her to lather his chin and neck as if for shaving. The inexperienced young wife did it, and during the first weeks of married life, was not a little astonished to learn the secrets of intimacy only in this way. Case number 102. 
Trapped in a circle of erotic ideas, the patient grows more and more peculiar. He avoids a society of women, only associates with them when two witnesses are with him, and only for the sake of music. Case number 83. His dreams are filled with aprons. Um, this poem is called, that's a shift in tone, I guess. Uh, maybe not. Um, this poem is called Dead Parental Units. Uh, it's in two parts. <clears throat> Number one, each death a sonnet, every grief 14 lines, not yours. I refuse you this one thing. I sat next to you in the hospital, your mouth open on one side, the last breath escaped. I connect you with no other dead or myself with the other weeping sons. I am only this son holding his father's dead hand, watching his father's dead mouth. I will not write you sonnets. Sonnets are boxes, spaces for pain, graves to lie in. Enough of graves. I save for myself your raw last line. Two. These are both 13-line sonnets. Another death, another sonnet, every grief, 14 fucking lines, not yours. I stood next to you in my sister's house. The family huddled around like reporters at a tornado. Terrified, we watched you drown. At dawn, they wheeled you out. Yes, mothers die and sons are sad, but I am not one of the many. I am one of the few who will not write you science. I'm sorry, maybe that would have given you, what, solace, satisfaction? <laughs> Sonnets are boxes, I mean coffins. You want me to build you a coffin? How many coffins do you need? Mm -hmm. um, this poem is a <laughs> series of a uh, couple that I did that were uh, kind of um, incompetent translations since I don't speak some of the language that I translated from. And, uh, or uh, this is a, from a series called Translations from the English. Uh, and, uh, so this is uh, my poem called Song of Unself. <laughs> I cerebrate myself and singe myself. And what you illum I refuse, for every good atom betrothed to you will to me betray. I chafe and incite my soul. I bake and chafe in my disease, my speech, every item of tongue foams in the soil free dust. Earth's parents, whose parents, I am 67, 68, 69 years. Chagrin besmears me, increases till death. Old shoals and obeisance. Nothing suffices as harbor but a permit to claw at every yawing ch chasm. Mm. Exuberance is beauty, lesion of enthusiasm. And uh, here's another translation. This one is a translation of uh, El Desdichado by Gerard de Nerval. I am Twilight's pissoir, orphan's <laughs> inclination. My star is dead. My constellation crushed. The Prince of Aquitaine has fallen and cannot rise. I am the shadow of wax wings slain. In the tomb, in the Outre tomb, I see the Sea of Capri, the hearse of Merci, la lune de Pantum, la place du Caprice. Désolé, désolé, where the vinegar and the wine are one. I am naked and red, Cherie. Give me back my color and my clothes. Give me back my singularity, my tristesse, my photo ID. <laughs> she sits in the gondola and burnishes her arms. She puts the piquant radish in her mouth. She takes a loofah and wipes the rainbow from her neck. And um, this one, uh, uh, I think I'll read a, a, a Cranshaw poem. Um, this one is called, uh, I have a character in a couple poems called Cranshaw. And uh, this one is called Cranshaw on a Boat. We are floating in the chain of lakes, eating Rice Krispies out of a bucket. <laughs> the sun is a soft lozenge medicating a bright red sky. Water skiers hold on to their slackening ropes like love itself. On Party Island, the icy drunks have seized control. Cranshaw has his hand inside Margaret. 
but no one is shocked. He was born brazen. <laughs> but when he starts in on the Jews, Arnie gets mad and pushes them over the side. We let him tread water, then swing around to pick him up. Justice? No. Margaret wants him back. <laughs> <laughs> um, and this one is called uh, Par Delicatesse. And there's a quote by Rambeau, and I, I really don't speak French, and so do you have to just forgive me. But he said, um, Par Delicatesse, je perdu ma vie. Um, because of sensitivity, I have lost my life. Par Delicatesse, one. Rambo said, Par Delicatesse, je perdu ma vie. In the delicatessen, I have lost my life. <laughs> <laughs> I know what he meant. I also have wandered among the smoked fish, lean pastrami, marble rye, have stood by the wicked pickle barrel, have stared longingly at the crumbly hava. Two. Dante said, one day he found himself in a delicatessen. <laughs> Selva Obscura. Not knowing which aisle to walk down, not knowing which meat to choose, he too felt that he had lost his life. I know what he meant. I too have suffered paralysis and a plethora of possibility. Belly or nova, herring or tongue, chub or sable, crepla or kishti, kugel or blueberry blitz. Three, Fitzgerald. In the real dark night of the soul, it is always three o'clock in the delicatessen. <laughs> oh, lost. Oh, lost. He lost his compass. He lost his compass in the. Sh he lost his compass in the schmaltz. I know what he meant. I have been in the 3 a.m. cream cheese. I have known the hole in the bagel. The potato knish is doughy. My life, a schmear in somebody else's appetite. <laughs> um, and uh, this one, the last one I'll read from, uh, from this book, is called The Basement of Desire. And um, uh, there's a poem by William Carlos Williams called The Attic of Desire. And my poem really has no relation to that poem other than the opposite title. Sooner or later, you realize that all the leftover wood you've been saving, all the scraps of PVC pipe in the utility closet, <laughs> all the plumbing nuggets you've squirreled away, all the used sandpaper, loose roofing nails, railroad spikes, iron filings, copper battery caps, coils of solder, cylinders of tin, carrots of glue, single hinges, tubs of bulbs, nylon cord, bladeless hacksaws, rusted caulk guns, bent nails on screws, broken hammers, brittle gaskets, sleeves of galvanized washers, leftover shims, insulation kits, cans of mineral spirits, screen door hardware, drawers of squeeze nozzles, noxious solvents, a whole haberdashery of plastic pieces, sheathing connectors, and containers is just a metaphor <laughs> of shifting meaning represented sequentially and recursively, your childhood, your body, your marriage, and your mind. <laughs> These are a few poems from uh, uh, Mark's book, a uh, book Mark published called The uh, Life of Christ. So the title, uh, there's, uh, there's an epigram for the book, and uh, it's by Adolphus of Smyrna from the Encantaron, and uh, the, uh, the epigraph is, I call poet, he who picks the lice off Christ. Um, who said that? I'll tell you later. <laughs> um, so the uh, first poem I read is called uh, Poem for Dan. Sometimes you're camping in Wisconsin, thinking about Melville and wondering what he'd make of Nat King Cole. And sometimes you're on a job in Idaho and you hear the pop of cooking soup but there's nothing in the microwave. And sometimes you're in Lubbock, in a hotel filled with polished apples and carts of recovered luggage. And sometimes you're in Boca Raton, in the company of salesmen whose wives died of complications. And sometimes you're in Park City, harried as a lariat, lonely as a Cody. And sometimes you're in Park Slope, staring from a convention window at girders so innocent they seem almost botanic. 
And sometimes, floating in the Gulf of Mexico, you close your eyes and let the water cover them. And then for a time, which seems like mercy, you don't know where you are, or remember where you were, or imagine where you may go. This one is called Babel. And it comes on the Tower of Babel and Isaac Babel Babel and <laughs> and Babel in general. We had a family copy of Isaac Babel's stories out of which my dad would read aloud when he was home, which owing to his employment issues was very often. I had no idea what I was listening to, but that's just another way to fail to define childhood, I guess. Anyway, the stories were short, some just a page, and I let my imagination sail away on some word that jumped out at me. One always did. And then, for those few minutes, I was outside the battered gates of self, alone in a city, <laughs> empty of rockets and God, where I saw tower after tower of arrested escape. Mm -hmm. This one is called Something He Wrote. Uh, there's a, a couple lines from Mayakovsky, and the translation is by Frank O'Hara. Mayakovsky wrote, in the cathedral of my heart, the choir is on fire. I love those lines. I just never realized he was talking about arson. <laughs> <laughs> and this is called Dolly's Temptation of uh, St. Anthony. And it's kind of a picture, it's, it's, it's a weird kind of configuration call. Temptation always comes to us as hairy algebra. In our rancid nakedness, we can offer back only the fractured icons of radiant geometry. Um, the center of this book is uh, three uh, aphoristic uh, pieces, uh, and I'm going to read a couple excerpts from, uh, from a couple of those pieces. Um, and uh, the first one I'm going to read uh, is from uh, Everything Molten Deserves a Mold. <laughs> Art is an ideological whore who will sleep with any propaganda or point of view. That's why there can be religious art, capitalist art, socialist art, racist art. Art is a promiscuous mistress. Lenny Reifenstahl is no different from Piero de Francesca or Giotto. The great Catholic art of the Renaissance is just the other side of despicable political propaganda. God versus Satan. In other words, art versus crap. We learn by, we learn by repetition. But what do we worship? Novelty. When the future becomes obsessed with the better, the past begins to ex be extinguished as the worse. The interesting begins in the absurd, but it doesn't end there. The dark edge of the profound is silly. Meister Eckhart, Swedenborg, Madame Blavatsky. The dark edge of the silly is profound. Edward Lear, Lewis Carroll, Calvino. People are afraid of artworks having only one meaning, as if that were somehow autocratic. Complex works of art have complex meanings. Complex doesn't mean multiple. Meaning does not change. Understanding of meaning changes. Misunderstanding is also understanding. The clearer one's sense of self, the sharper one's vision. Only the mason has the deepest understanding of the imperfections of his wall. Literature is a vanity mirror. We stare into another person's soul and see only ourselves. There is the imagination of the creator and there is the imagination of the audience. They are antagonists. The purpose of literature is not to set us dreaming, but to discipline our dreams. And now I'll read a little bit from uh, the uh, aphoristic piece called uh, Addictions. <clears throat> All advertising is an appeal to pleasure and a warning about pain. Prostitutes, blackmailers, drug pushers, and extortionists mentor the advertisers and teach them their trade. 
marketing, psychology for capitalists. Selling comfort is still selling. How hypocritical of capitalism to condemn monopoly and profiteering. Profiteering is the point of capitalism. Monopoly, it's goal. In order to be masters, people so desire money that to acquire it, they consent to being slaves. It's the 21st century and we still have maids and waiters and doormen and drivers and guards and caretakers and house painters and tutors and shoe blacks and prostitutes. Why? Because money is still the fuel and hegemony is still the car. You can try to go through life with clean hands, but you do so at the price of your soul. The evil of money is that it allows you to forsake our human duties. Slavery can be legislated against, but can never be abolished. We're no longer slaves to human owners, but we're still slaves to our desires, our fears, our histories, our ideals, and our genes. There's no significant difference between the kid in fourth grade who is willing to lick a dirty floor for a quarter and the employee who is willing to do anything to keep his job. If there's a collective unconscious, there's also collective addictions. Standing in a crowd, addiction by association. The mob intoxicates. The opiate is the people. <coughs> um, and I'll just uh, read a couple, uh, a couple more. Um, this one is called uh, Eight New Ways of Looking at Law. <laughs> one, the mind in its righteousness waffles. Two, the conscience in its scrupulousness waffles. Three, the heart in its cupidity waffles. Four, the soul in its annihilation waffles. Five, the tongue in its appeasement waffles. Six, the skin in its lethargy waffles. Seven, the body in its luxury waffles. Eight, life in its delirium waffles. And I'll finish with uh, uh, this poem uh, called uh, The Separation. Wrote Yeats, the intellect of man is forced to choose perfection of the art or of the life. <clears throat> Who was Yeats to posit that separation? I pondered Yeats. I pondered my heart. I pondered my past. I pondered my children. I pondered my marriage. I pondered my future. I concluded, life is rich pudding. Life is rough soup. Thank you. <laughs> well, thank you everybody for joining this sort of unbelievable melange of Mad Hat, Savannah Barber. Thank you, Bill, for the amazing presentation of, of your amazing poems, uh, be it in your inner haiku or <laughs> The Lights of Christ, which I'm still picking out somewhere. Arigato <laughs> gozaimasu. <laughs> <laughs> and to all of you, a great night.